MPH Sports Podcast. Talk sport and property with sports people discussing their careers and how property played a part in it. Rob Keogh, welcome to Talk Sport and Property. How are you doing? Good, thank you, mate. Thanks for having me. Do, uh, good to be back down. I know. Well, yeah, welcome back to the offices, mate. It's always good to see your friendly face here. You like it, didn't you? I'll be charging you rent at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's nice what you got it for, isn't it? To get people down and uh, come into the office. It's not far from home, so why not come down and then play a bit of golf after? I know, looking forward. How is your golf? I saw you on Instagram recently playing the Lynx courses over in Scotland. Yeah, I've not played for a while before that and uh, went up to Scotland, played the old course, which is fantastic. Uh, lost a few balls, but... Hopefully it'll be all right today. <laughs> Good. Well, listen, thanks for coming down, mate. Okay, well, look, let's talk about your very impressive and also very loyal career. You ready? 29 years of age, born in Dunstable, over 6,647 career runs, 218 professional appearances for North Ants, a product of the system for over a decade. So when did you discover your talent and passion for the sport, mate? Um... Just going to watch Dad play down at the local cricket club down at Dunstable Town. Um, he used to play every Saturday and Sunday and I think Mum used to say to him, you've got to take Rob with you. If, you, if you're going to be away for the weekends, um, you got to take Rob with you. So he used to go down and the people he used to play with had similar, similar age kids. So we used to just mess around and play a bit of football and cricket down the local cricket club and then just got into it from there. Just wanted to play. Was your dad good? Uh, he was all right. He only played club cricket, but... He had a good reputation in the in the local leagues, which is nice. Um, and it was someone for me to look up to as a as a young boy, um, wanting to get out there and copy him, really. Yeah. Okay. So you're named the pride of Dunstable on the North Ants profile website. I mean, it sounds like you're the the David Brent of Slough, mate. What's what's going on? Think, you, uh, is Bedfordshire a county you often shout about? Then I think someone's having <laughs> me on there. They, I always get a bit of stick from being from Dunstable. Cricket's a posh boy sport. Um, <laughs> Dunstable, not not so posh. So they always give me a little bit of stick. Um, but no, I, I owe a lot to Bedfordshire um, and a lot to Dunstable. Actually, they they sort of helped me throughout my career. They gave me the opportunity. So whenever I get the chance, I try and play for Bedfordshire and try and play for Dunstable as well, just as a little um, sort of payback, really. Because like I said, I, I owe them quite a lot. Is that allowed then? Yeah, it is. A lot of guys, if you get the chance, you can go and play local club cricket. Most guys tend to go and find a club and get a little bit of pocket money. But I just feel like it's more fun for me to go and play with mates um, and give back to Dunstable, who who sort of helped me get where I am now. Yeah, fair play. Well, Rob, when did you join the academy at North Ants? And and how was life as a a teenager at the academy? Because I'm I'm intrigued to know, is it... Is it similar to other sports where the pressure is always on? You're always having to try and earn that new contract uh, with a with an end goal to get into a first team. Yeah, so I I first got picked up by North Ants at about I think I was about twelve or thirteen, and they had a program that they call the EPP, the Emerging Players Program. So I was still playing for Bedfordshire at the time, but I was going up twice a week to train. Um, in Northampton because Bedfordshire is a minor county they call it and Northants is a is a major county so I was going up there while still playing for Bedfordshire and then they asked me to to join them pretty much um, so I, I joined them at 15 and, and got onto the academy and just sort of trying to play as much cricket as I could trying to enjoy it as much as I could and then luckily got my first contract I think I was, well, I would have been 18, 19. Like so a, a long time ago now, then. Almost like a development contract, <laughs> they call it. Yeah, a long time. <laughs> out, yeah, um, Like a development contract and then got my first full-time pro not long after that. So it's very proud. It's a long, it was tough juggling sort of school. I was playing football as well a little bit as a kid. School, football um, and cricket. Obviously being from Dunstable and having to travel an hour to Northampton um, Dad used to finish work in London, come back to Dunstable, pick me up from school and then drive up to Northampton and then back down twice, three times a week. So I've already given him a bit of a shout out. But again, I, I wouldn't be here now if he, he wouldn't have had those commitments. No, he's, no I've met your dad. He's a, he's a, he's a lovely guy. And, and you know what? Parents um, make such sacrifices for their, for their children to, to 
establish the career that they go on to, to create. I mean, obviously, you, you mentioned about your dad, and, and obviously, I've got two kids at that beginning of that journey, really. And, um, oh, you know, you, you're talking six, seven times a week, and the mileage and the cost and everything else that comes with it. So, um, yeah, listen, great bit of a shout out love there for, for Mr. Keogh, definitely. Um, you made your debut for in 2012, and I love a debut conversation. Um, how was your debut, Rob? And was this a fixture that you felt nervous for? Was there a crowd there? What was the pre-match feelings, I guess? Because, you know, you would have still been very young at the time. Yeah, so that, that one in 2012 was my first class debut. Crickets, we got three formats. Yeah. Um, so the one in 2012 was my first class debut and I wasn't expecting to play. It was in Cardiff. I was sort of there as backup, really. Wasn't expecting to play. Like, didn't prepare well at all, if I'm honest. Um, just thought I was going to be there carrying the drinks and um, making the cups of teas and the coffees for the for the boys. So I guess um, you didn't probably get time to feel nervous because you wasn't expecting to actually play. Yeah, that's it. And then I think someone went down in the warm-up and I still hadn't been told. And we got into the huddle, which is not long before you go and do the toss and select the teams and... They uh, saw the coach pull out a little cap behind his back and I thought, well, I'm the only one here who hasn't got a cap, so this is me. And that's when it started to get nervous and I, I had about an hour till the start. It didn't go too well. I didn't, I didn't score many runs, but it was a great experience, great to learn. Picked up my first wicket, which was nice and it was just nice to be involved. I guess the expectations from the club wouldn't have been on you anyway, so I guess the expectations would have come from yourself to have done well. So... I wouldn't have worried about I mean, the whole point of it really is it's a debut it's an opportunity isn't it and you're always going to kick on and, and, and use the experience that you gained on the day to, to progress into the for further selection I guess yeah of course I think at that point we were sort of out of the competition anyway so we, there was no real pressure on the team to get a win so it was all about sort of yeah giving me an opportunity the senior players sort of trying to help me out and just learning from the whole experience and it was brilliant in September the same year in the match against Hampshire you scored your maiden first class century and then progressed to 221 including an unbelievable 32 boundaries what a game that must have been for you personally yeah it was amazing like I I'd done well in the build up to that, but never really kicked on. I was always getting thirties or forties and you sort of get little grumblings, oh he, you know, he looks looks good for thirty and then he's out and in cricket you get judged on hundreds. Um so for me to make my first hundred a double hundred was well it was amazing really and it sort of gave me the confidence to know that I belong in first class cricket, um, which is always nice. I, I I'd imagine it's the same in other sports. You just need that one big performance to give you that confidence to know that you belong there and that you can sort of kick on from that point. Rob, I read that you have scored at least one century in each subsequent season since you have been at the club. What preparation and training do you apply to remain this consistency? I think it's all just, like you say, consistency is a massive thing. For me... When I prepare, I try and do the same thing every game, um, home or away. I have some strange superstitions. I know you know Wakers very well. He, he would vouch for that. I, I do some strange things, but cricket's a strange sport. We need to know more. But yeah, we'll save that for the <laughs> um, Yeah, I think it's all, for me, it's all about consistency and preparation. Yeah. I try and work hard in the winters. That's a time for me to really concentrate on my technique. And then in the summer, just it's more tactics and more getting down to the nitty gritty and just playing and backing my ability, really. I I know you're obviously quite a hard person on yourself um, as a professional, but also in, in other things, you know, you mentioned obviously about your golf. I've, we've played golf, God, I don't know, 30, 40 times, I guess <laughs> now, Rob. Um, and you are quite hard on yourself. You are a bit of a, a, a perfectionist. Do you expect these results each season? Yeah, I do. I do always try and be as good as I can be and try and perform as well as I can for the team. I am fairly hard on myself. If I have a bad net session at training, I take it badly and I'll try and stay behind and put things right. Also, if things do go well, I try and analyse that as well, look at what went well and 
try and learn from from that to take into the next game. So I think it's trying to take the rough with a smooth. Um, sometimes I'm not very good at it. <laughs> As you've seen on the golf course, there are, there is a few tempers sometimes. But it is trying to stay consistent. And like I said, to score 100 in each each season I've played is is pretty special. And it is a goal of mine, actually, that I've had, I think, since the third one. I've said to myself that I want to try and get one every year that I play. So touch wood, it's going all right so far. Good. It was 2015 you achieved a PB by hitting 876 runs in just the 18 games. Um, Obviously only 124 off an incredible 1,000 milestone. Knowing you, your personality and your passion, are you, I guess, surprised or maybe even a little disappointed that you haven't hit that 1,000 run figure yet and I need to ask is that quite difficult to achieve yeah it was it was a looking back it was a decent year of mine but um, I'm very frustrated with that year I got off to an absolute flyer I think I was 600 runs at the halfway point I think even a few more and I needed to average something silly like 20 average 20 to get a thousand runs and it'd be the first time someone had scored a thousand runs for North Dance for I think it was five or six years so but I got so in my own head constantly looking at um, the run how many runs I was away how many I'd need to average and obviously when you you're not doing very well the average gets higher you need to score more per game and I just got totally muddled up and trying to achieve this goal I actually fell short I had a stinking rest of the year um, which was more frustrating for me because at the start I was just enjoying my cricket just playing Um, it was almost that young kid mindset again just Mm. loving playing cricket and the results were taking care of himself rather than searching for results not getting the results and then being in a bit of a slump going into the next game and it just carried on to the end of the year. Mindset in sport is just so incredible, isn't it? You know, I mean, like you said, you're playing as a, with the, the mindset of a, of a child, just enjoying your sport, going out there, out to the crease, smashing balls, enjoying it. Then all of a sudden you overthink things and you're chasing a milestone that's important to you, important to the club and you fall short. Is there someone in the club that you can turn to to maybe discuss that? As you say, you're at the halfway point thinking, well, hang on a second, I've I've started off to an absolute flyer here. Um, This is well within my reach now. Do you not maybe prepare psychologically with the club a plan to achieve that comfortably as opposed to with the pressure on your shoulders to to achieve that in a different way? Yeah, I mean, we've got a a new batting coach in the last couple of years and he's sort of mentioned to me a few times this year that I've it's been going well this is how many runs I'm on and I just say to him politely look I've had this before um, as long as I'm enjoying my cricket then I know the results will take care of itself if I have a bad game it's fine mm-hmm. as long as I go into the next game enjoying it you know the results can turn around rather than that mindset again like you say of trying to chase that milestone if you have a bad game and then you pile more pressure on yourself and it can just build and it's one thing I've learnt from that year um, and just purely trying to focus on enjoying the sport and I think the results will take care of themselves from that. I think we also need to take into consideration here and factor in that that was 2015, six years ago. You were probably only 22, 23. So... It, that must be quite normal. You're still a very young, talented athlete at that point. Not that you're still not a young, <laughs> talented athlete at the moment, Rob, you know. But um, surely at that age, you're bound to make those mistakes in order to, not mistakes, but you're going to learn from the experience of what has happened at the halfway point, thinking, well, if this happens again, I'm going to approach the second half slightly differently. Yeah, of course. And I was quite lucky with the start of my career. I I did quite well at the start and I think that also put more pressure on me to do well because you start getting spoken about, um, teams start to do a little bit more research and homework on you for, for the next games and that sort of 
when you first get picked, I was absolutely loving it, doing well. And then all of a sudden there's a bit more pressure because teams know who you are now. You're not just a young kid on the block who no one knows much about. Um, so that comes into it a little bit. But like you say, now I'm, I'm older and wiser and I can sort of see these things happening or if they are happening, I can notice it a bit earlier and just sort of try and remind myself that it's not the be all and end all. Cricket mm-hmm. is... It's a sport, it is a job, yes, but, you know, results for me tend to come when I'm enjoying the sport. If if I feel under pressure or if I'm not enjoying it, then that shows me that, you know, that that's when I'm sort of in my bad bad run of form. And I guess it's, the, it's now that sort of knowledge and experience that you can pass on to some of the, the younger lads. I know, you know, you've been very kind enough to introduce me to a few of the younger boys there, even they're sort of too young to be buying property at this point but it's great to show some mentorship um, and some guidance and I guess that is is important for, for you um, uh, within the squad and we'll, we'll talk about your, your role a bit later in the pod um, I want to fast forward to the following season now if that's okay 2016 a real historical memorable season for you and for the club Rob, you were the, the focal point of two memorable moments at its best in during the T20 2016 finals day. Um, firstly, taking the flying catch on the fence to dismiss Andre Russell before hitting the winning runs in the final against Durham. I mean, your north hand side defied injuries, players on international duties, plus obviously the club uh, experiencing some financial difficulty at the time to go on and win the finals and I've been to your house I've seen the the amazing pictures and, and the bat that's framed and everything else would you mind through your eyes talking um about that experience about the finals the 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 event leading up to the finals and 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 how it all planned out for you yeah so it's in 2013 sort of 2013 2014 the the club sort of got together um and we mentioned Wakers before, you know Wakers very well. He he was a young captain and they sort of said, this is our goal. We want to be a successful white ball team. We want to compete and win trophies. So we sort of brought it on board. We tried to become a little bit fitter, a little bit stronger and give it a real go. And we got so close as a team that I think that helped. We were living and loving everyone's success, which we were very fortunate to have because I don't think that happens in all, all changing rooms. But we had a fairly inexperienced group with some experienced players and we just got off to a roll. We just got off to a flyer and we just kept that momentum going. And like I said, we, we were enjoying each other's success and it was quite funny actually. We we were having beers before games, going into games, knowing that we were going to win, even though we'd probably had uh, copious amounts of alcohol the night before. And T20 is a night game, so you get a bit of a lay-in. But we had a couple of young up-and-coming stars. We had a young captain in Wakers, and we had some experienced um, pros in the team. And it was just a perfect balance. And yeah, get, getting to finals day is... Amazing. We'd done it in 2013 and we'd won it. Wake is his first year as captain. And then 2015, we lost in the final. Um, so we we felt like we owed it to ourselves to go on the next year and win it again after losing a tight one in the final the year before. Um, and a shout out to Josh Cobb that game in the final. I think we were nine for three or something, which stats say in cricket, if you lose three early wickets in the power play, you don't win many games of cricket. And... Cobby, I know you spoke a little bit to Cobby actually. He he played one of the best innings I've seen in 2020 cricket. I think he got 90 off not many balls, just took on a counter-attack with Wakers playing the, the anchor and I was lucky enough to go in needing not many and, and just knock off the uh, knock off the winning runs and be out there to pull the stump in and lads all coming on, running on the pitch and jumping all over is an amazing feeling and the next day had a bit of a headache after the, the celebrations but it wasn't we had a game not long after that I think two days after we had travelled up to Worcester and we carried on the celebrations which I don't think the coach was too happy about but it, <laughs> it's all good fun that's brilliant I was going to ask you how the celebrations were and how the hangover was knowing you ok well, mate that, that, that's wicked you know I mean I know Wake is a fantastic captain and and, uh, and I wish him every success in his, in his retirement now. Um, but that's a fantastic story. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, 
You've you've been a permanent fixture in the Northamptonshire side for a number of years, and even took um, nine for fifty two against um, against Glamorgan at Wanted Road in that very same year. The six best bowling figures in in Northampton's history. When you look back on your career, um, I know you've got a few more years yet, mate. So, uh, but are these sort of stats and these kind of special historic moments are they important to you? Um. I think yes for when you finish your career. While playing, I don't think they are. For me, it's always been about the team. I'd much rather not do well personally in the team win. When you're playing in a winning team, it's amazing. The the feeling of knowing that you're winning most weeks, it, it brings the team together. You're playing with your mates and it's just so much better than being in a team that's struggling to go over the line and I've experienced that. There was there was a year where everything just went wrong for us and it's tough going out there and losing pretty much um, every game you play. So for me, the team winning has always been more important than personal success. But when you finish your career, it is nice to look back and see that you've got a high score of 2-2-1 and best bowling figures of nine for 52 you know not many people can say they've got those milestones they're they're pretty they are pretty good and it's something I'm proud of yeah that sort of comment doesn't surprise me actually with you and that's probably the reason why you were you were made the the rep of the, the the PCA for the team I want to know what this kind of role includes and why you think you were selected for this position uh, so the role is there's not much to it actually normally but because of the strange few years we've had in cricket and then with COVID um, going on it's been pretty hectic um, I was on Zoom calls most most days during COVID trying to negotiate players pay cuts and all those sort of things with, with the other reps but I think I, I was sort of luckily unlucky to get picked um it was a good friend of mine who had it before he retired and sort of said to me over a few beers you're going to be PCA rep and at the time I was like I don't want that I just want to play cricket but I can honestly say it's been fantastic and I've learned so much Mm. um I feel like it's made me a better person off field I feel like I can speak to new people with more confidence it's just I think it's just massive for me for life after cricket as well telling people that I've been a rep of a of a sporting organisation it it is a talking point and people want to know about it which is great Um, and it has done my confidence in in speaking to new people and dealing with problems off field um, a world of good so yeah it's been good yeah I must be honest um, I mean you and I have known each other for obviously for a couple of years now and um, and I and I know quite a few members of obviously the North Hand squad I couldn't think of a better person they could ask for the role uh, in truth Rob you know you are very passionate you do care for people um, and you're also prepared to sacrifice your own golf game for the boys <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it yeah. that's only because I normally blob most I was just want to my partner to keep us in the game look lastly before we jump into uh, our question fire round how was cricket during Covid and What's it been like since the fans are back? I mean, obviously, I was there at a recent game against Lancashire recently. Lucky touch. Me, <laughs> yeah, me and yeah. the, the kids that joined in. Um, but what's it been like? Um, it was strange. So we we had pre-season tour um, to Singapore just as COVID sort of really kicked off in the UK. We were reading news of um, football matches being postponed and all the sort of events happening back home that are being cancelled and we're in Singapore um, a 14 hour flight away um, lads have families young young children and stuff and we sort of made the decision as a team to come back early leave the tour get back to the UK and make sure everything's right for the players families so we got back and literally from the day we got back I think we went into a lockdown so cricket got put on hold as everything else did we were having constant calls with the PCA and the ECB trying to work out a a plan of getting back to cricket really and it was the same for everyone we we were just stuck indoors for the duration of the lockdown we we were getting sent 
home fitness programs and you make the most of your your run outside and then we finally got back into cricket and it was just bizarre it was in we started off training in little bubbles of four or five players and then we got into games and with no fans there it was just bizarre it was like playing practice games um every week and I personally didn't enjoy it I struggled I I just found it really bizarre and couldn't really get the buzz of of playing um but we ended up doing all right in the in the T20 the back end we qualified for the quarter final um it's just a shame that there were no fans there to to see it um but it was all just really bizarre and I'm glad things are back to normal right now Good. Well, I think on that very positive way to conclude the sports section of the, of the pod, should we jump into the uh, the question fire round? Yeah, let's have it. One, batting or bowling? Batting. The favourite ground you have played at? Lords is amazing, but the Rose Bowl at Hampshire, where I got my two hundred, I think is is a personal favourite. Your best career highlight? Twenty sixteen final. Final day. Your role model or who your inspiration was growing up? I used to love an Australian called Michael Clark. It's a strange one for an English cricketer to look up to a, an Aussie an cricketer. Aussie. There's a bit of a rivalry there, but it turns out I, I ended up getting to play with Michael Clark in Australia. I went out to Australia for a winter and played at his club and was lucky enough to play and share a dressing room with him for a couple of games wow. and I was like a young kid I, I think it took me a good few hours to pluck the courage and go and speak to him but no Michael Clark he's, he was good awesome well would you ever go into coaching or management or even a, a senior role within the, the sport one day uh, yeah I think so I, I could see myself going into coaching or, or management um it's a tough one in cricket that there's not many jobs in the professional game and that's something I'd like to, to do, coach in the professional game, not necessarily go down and, and do the sort of kid stuff, but I'd love to do an academy coach or a second team coach, that sort of thing. Yeah, you never know. No. Your favourite sport away from cricket? I'm intrigued to know where the answer is. This. Yeah, it's got to be golf, uh, golf or football. But at the minute, it's, it's probably golf, yeah. Even though Chelsea are playing so well. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it is a tough one. I do enjoy my football, as you know. We're, we're constantly firing what's up when what's <laughs> Chelsea are playing. So I do enjoy my football. If you could play another sport professionally, what would it be and why? Oh, that is a tough one. I mean, football is amazing. For Chelsea or on the on yeah, the football's golf amazing. It's obviously the it's the biggest sport in the country. That is amazing. But I like traveling the world. I think being a professional golfer, you get to travel the world. Be be based in a, a lovely golf resort in America sounds um, sounds pretty good to me. I don't blame you for that one. Um, do you have a nickname? Yeah, Keezy. Pretty simple. Um, when I first started out. It was Chav. They called me Chav. Obviously, Dunstable. They were private school boys, um, all Silver Spoon boys, and they loved the fact that I went to a normal school. Well, I called it a normal school. Yeah. They called it uh, something else. But yeah, that 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 wore off. Luckily, brilliant. If you wasn't a cricketer, what do you think you would be doing now? Uh, probably a used car salesman or, or something like that. I, I was not great at school. Um, just wanted to play sport don't have any qualifications um i honestly have no idea what i'd do but i've always said to myself and my mates that i'd find a way of making, making money. money and yeah probably be selling dodgy range Rovers <laughs> in a garage in dunstall somewhere <laughs> and what's the next big goal for rob keo just to continue the cricket career, I want to play for as long as possible. Um, I still feel like my body's okay. I'll let you know after the first tee. Um, but I still feel like the body's okay. I'd love to play as long as possible and hopefully win some more trophies for, for North Ants. Superb. Mate, that was brilliant. Let's, uh, let's come back and talk property. 
Talk Sport and Property Podcast, sponsored by MPH Sports Property Academy. Download the app today from the App Store or Google Play by typing in MPH Sports, the trusted go-to app for sports people looking to buy or learn about property. Rob, welcome back, mate. Um, look, you and I started talking after the property workshop I did for the PCA back in April, May um, last year um, during the first lockdown. Are workshops or what we did a webinar, is it a common thing that the PCA tend to organise and, and arrange? Yeah, the PCA are brilliant. They they do workshops for us um, every winter. We, we probably have four or five workshops each winter on all different sort of things and they send messages out to reps to find out what the squad are interested in doing that year they send some options and they organize it all and they are brilliant but that was the first property workshop that i've i've ever done and property is something in my opinion that interests everyone even if they don't really know it they're interested in property you have to buy one to live in it so for me for that to come up was was perfect yeah is, is that the reason why you decided to join in? Because it was really popular, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think I think that was one of the most popular ones we did. I mean, I've always been interested in property, always wanted to do it, but didn't really know how. Um, so as soon as the PCA sent that email out to say that this workshop's on, I made sure I was out of my busy lockdown schedule. I made sure I was available for that one. So after that workshop... You, it was almost immediately, um, and I remember this, uh, that you sent me a WhatsApp. Um, so you and I organised a Zoom call because Zoom call was like where we did back then. I mean, what would we have done without Zoom call in that first lockdown? Oh, no, no, it was no. unbel- unbelievable, wasn't it? So, um, and then that conversation went really well. I felt like I was actually just talking to a, to a mate I've just never met before with, with you. And then we, because you were quite interested to kind of explore the next stages and then we obviously got your dad involved in a zoom call with your dad remember you hearing you in your your dining room uh chatting then it wasn't before long we got a property company set up for you um and fast forward only what i mean that was like 15 16 months ago that was i mean that is nuts i mean we've seen each other a lot actually since (laughs) yeah um but i'm pleased to say i mean you're about to own two investment properties right did you think setting up a property company would be that simple, I guess? No, not at all. I, I'd always, well, I'd not even thought about setting a property company up until till doing the workshop with you. And I remember watching it and thinking, it can't be this easy. The way he's explaining it, it can't be this easy. And that was one of the reasons why I messaged you and said, can we have a phone call and, and tell you my situation personally rather than, you know, a workshop that's, that's there for, I think we probably had 60 people on it from the PCA. And for you to explain it and guide me through it, and I know I had a few insecurities about thinking that because you're involved with football that cricket's not that well paid compared to football and rugby, whether I would have enough money um, and my personal situation. And I just couldn't believe how, how easy it was. And it has flown by and yeah, I'm staring down the barrel of two, two rental properties. And I need to ask, how have you found the support and experience from obviously just, not just myself, but you know, from obviously the, the, the team that I've got at the other side of this wall here with Lou and, and Hannah, um, how have you, cause you, obviously your dad's been involved as well. How have you guys found our team along the way? Oh, amazing. I, I thought you'd probably get annoyed at me at the start. I was ringing you all the time with forms. I didn't know what was going if you, on. If you was a Tottenham fan, I would have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't blame you. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't really understand much of it. I'd always sort of give you a quick phone call or a WhatsApp and just say, what's this all about? And it's been amazing. The support's been amazing. And Lou, with the my most recent one, has been fantastic. She's been on the end of the phone whenever I've needed it she's probably annoyed at me as well so I, I'm looking forward to them being done and give you guys a bit of a rest <laughs> well I think the, the most important thing for us is to make you feel comfortable and if we can provide you that sort of hands on approach throughout from the, the during the entire process then it is only ever going to encourage you and encourage others to come back and explore um, what you've experienced and, and to clarify to anyone that, that listens to this 
you we found you two properties. The first one was during the the, the early stages, which was a two bedroom flat up in the Midlands, um, and then we we also found you a a two bedroom house in the northeast more recently. Um, both rents, I think, Rob would bring you in a gross income of about. 13, 1400 pounds per calendar kind of month. Uh, what's that, 16, 17 grand a year. Um, and the profit on those two acquisitions for the, the property company would be around sort of 700, 750 pounds per calendar kind of month, which I think that's about right, isn't it? Yeah, I think that sounds about spot on. I know uh, the first one we got was the, the Redditch flat and it sort of, suited my personality perfectly really there was a 10-year um rental agreement completely hands off and i know after to chatting to you before that 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 was always something i'd looked at i wanted to be fairly safe with my first couple and then the second one that came up i recently renovated you've told me it's it's very safe and i'm just looking forward to them getting out there and getting people in them yeah. and sort of growing that pot to go again well what you've bought although yours is in far better condition than mine i've it's something similar to what i've done i've bought two myself um uh, both in in fairly good condition not as brand new as, as the one you're buying um but my ones were getting sort of 495 i think your one's going to be going onto the rental market for about sort of five two five five fifty actually isn't it so you, you should get a little bit more which would reflect the the incre- increase in price um, but um, but yeah, looking at recent acquisitions that we bought within that that sort of pocket in the northeast, um, they've all rented so so well. I mean, both of mine let within sort of three to five working days. I'm, I'm sure you'll you'll um, get the same. Um, to clarify, did you do interest only on your mortgages? Yeah, I did interest only on both of them. It it was something that. I think we had argued a few times about Yeah, we did, yeah. Dad's um dad's very old school. He's pay off pay off your properties. Um and I sort of couldn't get my head around not not being able to pay it off, but after thrashing it out with you many times and actually other people who I know have properties and also mortgage mortgage brokers have all said that interest only is, is the way to go and I decided on it and I 100% agree now. Um, all right, you're not necessarily paying it off, but for me, the monthly income um, is more important and the equity that I'll hopefully get in the properties, um, it just worked out so much better for me to go interest only. Yeah, so the, the, the main reasons why we tend to encourage interest only, um, particularly you in, in the career that you're, you're at in, in the stage where you're at in your life right now, is that the money you've invested in the next 10 years, you may need that back. You might not, you know, you might come out of cricket, you might actually fall into a really good job with a high paid salary, so therefore your career continues. But if it doesn't, then you may need to withdraw some of that money. Now, if you're paying back the, the, the loan to the bank, their money before you pay back yourself, then that's great, but you're paying back the debt to them, whereas actually, how I see it is that it's more important to pay yourself back the money before you pay back the bank. So within, I've worked out within sort of, I'd say between seven and 10 years, 10 years worst case scenario, including maybe a contingency and we need to factor in the 19% corporation tax over those 10 years. I would say probably realistically by year eight or nine, you would have your total investment back that you paid into the property company back into your personal account again, which means these two properties owe you nothing, but you still get your 700, 750 pound a month net income. And for me, you've then got choices because you can either just buy yourself another two, and therefore suddenly your 750 is gonna become probably more like 11, 1200 pound a month net income um or you um you take the money out and you you do what you want with it but it gives you it gives you options before you pay the the bank back their money and plus remember you get to offset your interest only mortgage against your 
um, gross income, which again reduces your your tax as well. And I know you've been very um, kind to refer me to a few of the boys. I've, I've, we've recently helped you, know, the skipper Adam uh, Rossington, by by a few. Um, he was actually on my case at the weekend, actually asking for another one. Um, and also Ricardo, you know, uh, who is a fantastic young talent, isn't he? Who you call Dave? Uh, <laughs> I still find that hilarious. Uh, by his 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 first home, is property a a common form of conversation around the club, Rob? Uh, it is actually, yeah. A, a lot of guys are, are into property and it's just knowing how to go about it really. And a few people have seen my property journey and asked me a bit about it. And, and that's why I've, I've passed them on to you really because I'm still a rookie. Um, I'm just sort of going along with, with your advice but it is something that is talked about a lot and it, it was when I was a kid in the changing room I was looking up to the senior players who, who all had rental properties and I just wanted to get into it really and it's good that the younger guys in the changing room now are, are interested in it and always asking for advice and I know a few of them have been on the phone to you and, and looking into it themselves which is great I want to bring up the fact that you are not only now a landlord with a investment portfolio, which is pretty cool. Um, you're also a homeowner. In fact, um, since I've seen you last, you've sold your existing property, and from memory, you've bought a, a new, a larger new build. Um, how did you find that experience? And can I say, um, I guess, because you were a homeowner previously, how did that experience help with the process on this new build? Um, I was very lucky with my first house actually in Northampton. I, I'd just signed my first contract and that year we'd won a trophy so you get a little bit of bonus money as well. I was actually on the way down to Northampton Mercedes until one of the, the senior guys grabbed me uh, fairly aggressively and said, come on, I'm taking you to, um, to look at some houses instead. You're not wasting your money and I'm forever grateful for that to be honest because I'd have been driving around in a in a nice little convertible Mercedes, um, still living at mum and dad's probably. But no, he dragged me over in these new builds um, not far from the ground and I fell in love with it there and then and it worked out pretty well. I, I went probably too big for what I could afford at the time but there was always a plan to, to rent a couple of the rooms out to some players. We always have players join who aren't local. It was a three three story house with a bathroom in the middle for for those guys and it just worked out brilliantly they they were rented out the whole time I was there um, and it just got to the point recently where the missus was putting me under pressure to to either kick them out or look at getting somewhere else and we decided to move on with the stamp duty holiday being in place and you actually helped us with the negotiations on that new one actually I remember having the, the zoom call with the the sales manager um, and yeah, we, we got over the line, purchased the show home. Yeah, I was, um, well, the fact that I'd been to your original house uh, on many occasions where we've had a beer after golf and, <laughs> and, and met your, your partner and stuff. Um, but I really felt that the property that you had, you had identified was the right decision in your life now. Um, so I was obviously as enthusiastic as you were to acquire that house at the right price and and it did come with its problems didn't it because it's a show it's a showroom and they were using it as a showroom but also as a sales office and they did propose a couple of, of different ideas that we thought well, we could we could look to negotiate which we did um, but listen you know it's 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 all it's all paid off and, and when are you due to move in? Uh, I think we're looking hopefully before Christmas. Um, but it, yeah, like I say, it, it was the perfect house for us. It's it's not been ideal that we haven't been able to move straight into it, but they're paying us rent for using it yeah. as a show home, which That's is right. great. And it's meant that we've been able to just move back to Dunstable for the short term and be around friends and family, which I don't normally get to do living in Northampton. So it's just, yeah, it's just the waiting game now yeah. and, and hopefully being there before Christmas. Well, I can't wait to see it. Um, would, I need to ask you from a, obviously a, a mate's point of view, would, would you say property is, is excitable but maybe a little bit daunting from a, a sports person's perspective? Because 
I love that story you've just said that you know you've obviously had a uh, you won the T20 2016 you've got yourself a little bit of a, a juicy bonus on top of your salary um, your first thing that you're thinking about is you know uh, spending on a, on a car um, drive down a Mercedes pick yourself up a nice little juicy um, convertible but but it's in essence it's a liability isn't it that's what it is oh, but, yeah. but you've had a, a, an older wiser head that's pulled you back and, and and helped you invest it in an asset which is, in fact the equity from that house that you bought in 2016 has probably now helped you pay for this even bigger more expensive property which is probably could be deemed your forever home yeah definitely I think I think I made 70, 70 or grand in, in five years on, on that house. And that that was went towards the deposit for the new one. So that, that was great. And I, I'm very glad I went for the, the house over the car. Um, but it is daunting looking, even now I still get nervous when, when you're sending me a property through and I'm saying, yes, go for it. I, I still get a little bit of a buzz and a bit of nerves. Um, it's just a little insecurity that I had when we first spoke. I felt like my salary might not be enough to get into property. But now, looking at it, it it's just fantastic for me. And life after cricket, there's nowhere near as much pressure to go and find a, a job straight away with the income that I'm getting from the rental properties. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer, Rob. I think, on a, on a serious note, do you think the our workshops can provide other players like you some of that missing knowledge that would help them during their career? Definitely, yeah, definitely. I, I know the the PCA would be would be keen to to keep you involved. I know you've spoken and dealt with a lot of cricketers already and guys have just seen from social media my involvement with, with you guys and just openly ask questions and I highly recommend the work that you've done and you can see that with the guys that I've passed on so far. I think there's probably four or five from our, our dressing room that have been in contact and if not got properties with you already. I know Wakers um, and Rosso and Ricardo have all got properties and you've spoke to other guys about their their plans as well. So I think it's definitely something that can continue in cricket. Your enthusiasm in property is slightly different, I would say, because even during lockdown where it was non-cricket season, you were very enthusiastic behind doing some work experience for us. So we would always talk, and I think we actually even spoke about maybe even giving you an, a, re, like a region, didn't we? And I think you even did a little bit of work for us over in the, sort of the Nottingham areas. And Nottingham yeah. was a bit of a hot yeah. spot at the time for us. We had, we had um, I think you even helped us lock in a, a sale for a, a lad at Derby County. Um, and we knew that was a, a city on the, on the rise. I mean, for us now, I mean, the, the figures don't really add up. In, in that particular uh, part of the country right now but um, you were so keen and I remember saying to you at the time Rob look if, if you wasn't still playing I'd be employing you tomorrow because you've got the mindset of exactly and the values of, of where we're at here in the office today you know um, we're always about trying to give you know free advice um, and you can see the team that work tirelessly we're here sort of 10 12 hours a day um, you know my phone's on sort of seven days a week um, and, and it is important to kind of share that 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 knowledge but your passion for property was was very motivating for someone who's been in property for as long as I have um, so I would most definitely encourage you to consider property as part of your future the fact that now you've gained so much experience with the two investments that you're about to complete on on top of the fact that you've already bought a second home and and you're still so young really i know you don't look oh, it but you me. are still so young um, <laughs> but um we 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 are developing our workshops um we also do a uh, a one on 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 buying a home which which we know has been quite popular with some of the, the, the football clubs. Um, so I probably should reach out to the PCA again. Um, we've subsequently obviously signed a three-year deal with the RPA and I know we've got sort of clubs lined up for that. And, and um, But I, I will um, maybe talk to you on the golf course about how we could maybe look into doing more in um, more in cricket. Um, but listen, before we go and play golf, because that's the whole point of today really, isn't it? Yeah, um, definitely. What would you say to any young 
sports person, wh- whatever sport they're in, that's now thinking about buying their first home or first investment property, um, having sort of experienced it now or firsthand? Uh, do your research. I've obviously, like you say, I've done a little bit of research in it. I've all, it's something that I've always wanted to do. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. I know I was badgering you and pestering you. Um, I mean, even last week when you were on your holiday, I think I sent you a couple of WhatsApps. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions. You can always learn and just go for it. I think I held off for so long worrying that I didn't have enough money or it wasn't for me, maybe. I probably held off a little bit too long, but now I've done it, I don't regret it at all and I wish I did it earlier. Mate, that is brilliant. Rob Keo, thank you so much for coming on, mate. It's so good to see you back here. Um, you know I always uh, love your company. Um, let's go and play golf, shall we? Great. Thanks for having me. Top Look man. forward to, uh, to beating you on the golf. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Keezy. Thanks for coming on Talks Form Property, mate. Cheers, man. You've been listening to Talk Sport and Property. Visit the App Store and download the MPH Sports app today or keep up with us over on Instagram.